been more than four decades in the making. Police have a man in custody. This in connection to a cold case dating all the way back to the 70s. WBRE, WIOU, Eyewitness News reporter Nicole Rogers live in Carbon County tonight with new details on how investigators solved the mystery. Nicole? In December of 1976, a boy was walking in this riverbank across the river right behind me when he noticed an open suitcase containing a human head. Nearly 45 years later, police have identified the two bodies found that day and have a suspect in custody. A 14-year-old boy was walking under the I-80 bridges over the Lehigh River in 1976 when he found an open suitcase containing a human head. He was telling me about, you know, that they went down to the river to play and they found these suitcases and uh, they opened the suitcase up and, you know, then they found the body. The discovery led police to two other suitcases containing the rest of her body and a nine-month-old fetus. After nearly 45 years, by using computer imaging and new technology, investigators finally put a name to the face. Police say she was Evelyn Cologne of New Jersey. She was 15 years old at the time. Dolly Mon lives less than a mile from where the body parts were found. She says she remembers it like it was yesterday. A knock came at the door and it was a cop and wanted to know if I had seen anything, you know. And it's ironic because my son and the young fella, Kenny Jumper, that found her, they were trapping and they would take turns checking their traps. She says she couldn't imagine if it would have been her son's turn that day. I'm kind of glad in the way that my son wasn't one of them, you know, by himself, because that must have been very traumatic. Mon says she lost hope in ever finding out whose body was left by her home, let alone ever tracking down a suspect. Now, police have Cologne's boyfriend at the time, Luis Sierra, in custody for her murder. It's a small town, but like I said, uh, it's just everybody couldn't believe they felt bad for, for the girl and for the baby, you know. And who could do that to someone like that? Evelyn Cologne's body was found nearly 45 years ago. Not once was she reported missing. I'll get into how police say her boyfriend went about the cover-up in another live report coming up at 6. Live along the Carbon County border, Nicole Rogers, 2822 Eyewitness News. Hello and welcome to episode 133 of Who Killed? I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media podcast. When I first started this show, a wise man, Nick, from the True Crime Garage podcast, whom most of you know if you're a regular listener, told me to do what I know best. So I thought long and hard about the case that I wanted to cover. And that is how I ended up on the Amy Mihaljevic case. There has been a lot of news about Amy recently, and that is a great thing. There have also been a number of decades-old cases in the news of late due to the rise of genealogical DNA and how it has revolutionized the tools investigators have in their bag. I've talked about this before, and I want to keep the focus this week on DNA and a case that seemed like it was destined to remain unsolved. This is a case that seems like it should have been solved, but due to the era the crime was committed, the 1970s, authorities couldn't identify the body. The case I am talking about this week is the grisly murder of Beth Doe, a.k.a. Evelyn Colon. On December 20th, 1976, police at Fern Ridge were trying to come to terms with the worst crime scene any of the officers had seen. They were trying to identify a dismembered body, which was found under the westbound bridge on Interstate 80 at Eastside Borough. The body and a female fetus were found at about 4.30 p.m. by Kenneth Jumper Jr., who was 14 and was from Whitehaven. He had been playing in the area. Now, the youth found the head and several parts of the body lying near some rocks. The fetus was lying about 10 feet to the east in the grass and weeds. Police said the body and three suitcases containing various body parts 
may have been thrown over the side of the bridge. The impact could have broken open one of the suitcases containing the head and several unidentified parts. In what is one of the most severe cases of overkill I've come across, the body had the nose and ears cut off, including the head. In what sounds like an extremely personal attack, the breasts were cut from her chest. Police told reporters they could not identify the body until an examination was made by a forensic pathologist. Coroner Robert Dyber would be involved in the investigation, and Jumper said his son had been running a trap line in the area of the discovery. About 250, Jumper said his son had been running a trap line in the area of the discovery about 250 to 300 yards northwest of their home on Tannery Head a suitcase containing the feet, heads, and arms, plus pieces of a chenille bedspread, were also found. The other suitcases and the fetus, again, were found under the bridge. The third case had the chest cavity and parts of the torso. One thing that stood out to investigators at the scene was that some of the parts had been wrapped in a newspaper, and they had concluded that it was the New York Sunday News, which was dated September 25th. And the paper had supposedly had ads for the Poconos. Now, when the body was discovered, the victim was carrying a nine-month female fetus. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled, and there was a gunshot wound in the neck. And again, there was no identity. Now, in a sickening twist which if you haven't thought this is sick enough, police never found her nose, breasts, and ears. And I don't even want to imagine that this was some sort of trophy for this disgusting human being. The parts of her body and that of her unborn daughter had been placed into those three suitcases. And again, police believed that the killer had tried to dispose of the body by throwing it off that bridge over the Lehigh River. Again, that's 300 feet. So police assume the suitcases were thrown from a vehicle that was traveling west, and police speculated that the killer hoped the suitcases would land in the river and the body would never be found. Much to the killer's dismay, he missed, and two of the suitcases landed in the woods, 20 feet from the river. The third suitcase nearly made it where he was hoping, and it was found on the riverbank, and this is the suitcase that contained the head and fetus. Now, reports state some of the other evidence collected was foam packaging and possible straw. The crime scene investigators also found a bedspread. Again, the body was removed by authorities and transported in plastic bags to the local hospital for examination. An autopsy was conducted on December 23, 1976, and concluded that the victim was a white woman in her late teens or early 20s. However, the big issue was they couldn't figure out who this woman was. The coroner reported the cause of death was determined to be strangulation, but there is the fact that she had also been shot in the neck. Now, the coroner released details of the body, and they were calling her Beth Doe at this point. And she was between 4 foot 11 and 5 feet 4 inches tall. She weighed approximately 140 to 150 pounds. Her hair was shoulder length and dark brown, and she had a blood type O. After the body was found, the victim was fingerprinted. Her teeth were examined and recorded on a dental chart. Missing persons reports throughout the United States and Canada were compared at the time to the victim, but were excluded. Now, again, this is the 1970s, so just remember, not everything was properly transmitted as far as who knew what about what victim and all that other stuff. It just, there wasn't the internet, let's just say that. And again, the medical examiner also noted that there was a set of numbers that had been written on the victim's body. But they had nothing to work with other than this body. And unfortunately, the investigation never really took off. I mean, they went and followed up on the newspaper stuff that 
they thought could have led them to New Jersey, and that's pretty much where it died. And um, no pun intended there, apologies. Uh, But again, these were all the factors that played against them. Now, Bill Landauer of The Morning Call wrote about the case of Beth Doe. Now, he writes, In the early 90s, when Tom McAndrew joined the state police, the older cops told him about Beth Doe. Her case had been tough, as horrific as it was impossible. Nothing they could find led to who Beth Doe was. She'd literally fallen onto Carbon County soil from the sky. In 1976, so far as they could tell, someone had thrown her mangled corpse off the Interstate 80 bridge. Landauer goes on to say, Solving a murder is hard enough when you don't know the killer's name. But when you don't know the victim's name, decades can pile up. Nearly 40 years later, Beth Doe is McAndrew's case. Her story, her killer, and her name are still outside of his grasp. But thanks to new technology, the cold case investigator could be closer than ever before. Landauer goes on to state that recently an anthropology professor from the University of South Florida had performed isotope testing on a tissue sample from Beth Doe's 38-year-old corpse. The new process can define the chemical content of water a murder victim ingested and then match the chemicals to a specific location. More technology, as things progress every year, every month actually, things improve. Again, there was writing on her body and the ink was believed to have been from a pen and was on the left palm of the victim indicating that she was right-handed. And the writing consisted of the letters WSR and the numbers four or five followed by four or seven. Again, her fingerprints were submitted to the FBI, but they did not match anyone in national databases. Again, the 70s. When she remained unidentified, a sketch was made and the public was asked for assistance. Landauer goes on to state that this did lead to some solid leads and information about the case was subsequently published across the country to generate more leads. As I mentioned before, the body was buried in 1983, but in 2007, they had her body exhumed, and this was to obtain additional forensic evidence and to create a new facial reconstruction. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released two reconstructions, The latest was in May 2015, and this was according to Landauer's article. Investigators remained optimistic about identifying the remains and solving her murder. Familial DNA eventually led investigators, or Luis Colon Jr., Evelyn Colon's nephew. Now, Beth Doe did have some distinguishing characteristics. And those were a small circular mole above the left eye. And she had another mole on her left cheek. Now, she also had a six-inch scar on her left leg, just above the heel. The coroner had determined that she had never suffered previous fractures. In regards to her ethnicity, she may have been Mediterranean heritage. And her estimated time of death was probably 24 hours before she was found. And again, Landauer writes that on December 20th, a 14-year-old boy found the body near the borough of Whitehaven. He says Whitehaven is a place with just a handful of homes, a hardware store, and a few bars near Lehigh Gorge State Park, and few people there remember much about the Beth Doe story. Landauer wrote the location is off of I-80, roughly 20 miles west of the highway's intersection with Route 33 and one of dozens of similar hamlets the expressway encounters as it shoots across Pennsylvania. Landauer says every day thousands of cars roar past Whitehaven over the Lehigh River, suspended on a bridge 300 feet high held up by concrete supports. The boy made his grisly discovery near one of the bridge supports on the Carbon County side of the river. 
someone traveling west on the interstate had tossed the three suitcases over the edge of the bridge, presumably aiming for the water below. We've discussed this before. And again, as mentioned, the impact had broken open two of the suitcases. The one unopened suitcase contained her arms and her legs. Now, according to the NCM. EC, the female was in her third trimester and her fetus, a girl, had been removed from her body and was found with her in one of the suitcases. That's just too much. In 1983, Carbon County officials buried her near the borough of Weatherly in Lorytown Road Cemetery, hidden at the center of the row upon row of evergreen trees that make up a Christmas tree farm. And again, she was buried in the county's Potter's Field, which Landauer says is a place where people are buried when their families cannot afford a funeral, or in Beth Doe's case, when no family can be found. White crosses mark each grave. He says flowers often adorn Beth Doe's grave, and long before officials had laid Beth Doe to rest, her case had gone cold. Landauer gets into the science, and he talks about McAndrew being a member of the State Police Crimi Criminal Investigation Assessment Unit, which is an arm of the agen agency that in part furthers the investigation of cold case homicides. The group includes investigators from barracks throughout the state. They get together once a month and compare notes. Cold cases are only part of his job, though, according to Landauer. He works other homicides and is an Amber Alert designee, for example. But he loves his cold case work. He likes bringing closure to families, especially families for whom closure no longer seems in the cards. Quote, I became intrigued about her, McAndrew said. For one thing, there was so much evidence apart from DNA. In the 1970s, forensic science was still primitive. Even the most forward-thinking officers did little to preserve tissue samples 40 years ago. But police knew what 95% of Beth Doe's face looked like, and artists were able to draw her. With Beth Doe, there were dental records, fingerprints, samples of cloth, a newspaper, writing on her skin, and, of course, the suitcases. This week's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well. Reach your goals with delicious, calorie-smart, and protein-smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes, too. HelloFresh makes entertaining easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats, like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonese slaw, and pineapple relish, or a snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. So go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use the code WhoKilled16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use WhoKilled16 for 16 meals plus free shipping.
This was an interesting and encouraging fact from Landauer's story, and that is, in Pennsylvania, a, quote, found body case are assigned random numbers, and investigators are required to update them once a year. So when a new method or scientific advancement becomes available, officers check it and see if it can be applied to their cold case. Nearly 14 years ago, on October 30th, 2007, a group of state police officers dug up Beth Doe's coffin, and they did this using an excavator and then their hands to avoid breaking the box that she had been placed in. Inside the coffin, county employees had placed her remains in a green bag, forward thinking, to protect them from elements. In a sweet gesture, Authorities had also placed Doe's unborn baby with her in the grave. Now, Landauer's deep dive into the case goes on to report the officers took the remains to a lab and removed samples. Two days later, they returned them, marking the simple funeral and replacing the wooden box with a metal one. About 20 people attended. Local religious leaders said prayers over her. Landauer says investigators sent the tissue samples from Beth Doe's corpse to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification in Fort Worth. There, forensic scientists developed a DNA profile and entered it into an international database. Families of missing people submit hair, nails, and other tissue samples to create their own DNA profiles and use the database to find matches. Landauer reported at the time no matches had been found for Beth Doe. McAndrew said that doesn't mean the exhumation was wasteful. Investigators were able to eliminate some possible missing person candidates. And as new science becomes available, and as states and federal funding materializes, investigators check their cold cases to see what techniques they can apply. And again, Landauer really goes deep into this case. For the past decade or so, scientists have been applying some ideas to forensics. For example, the New York Times reported that the investigators in England applied the science to the remains of a small boy who was found near the Thames River in 2001. Using specialized equipment, investigators discovered a chemical that led them to believe the boy was from Nigeria. Eventually, authorities were able to determine the boy's identity. The practice, known as chemical, stable, and heavy isotope analysis, has been used for years by archaeologists and anthropologists. Its application in forensics is newer, though, and it has given McAndrew new hope. Now, a few months went by, and McAndrew sent some of the Beth Doe's. At one point, McAndrew sent some of Beth Doe's tooth enamel, bone, and hair samples taken when investigators exhumed the body in 2007 to the University of South Florida for analysis. The university recently presented McAndrew with the first new information about the Beth Doe case in decades. Landauer says if the findings are correct, Beth Doe was born and spent her early childhood in Western or Central Europe. She moved to the United States as a child or a teenager. She spent at least five to ten years in the United States before her murder. She also most likely became pregnant in this country, and she probably lived in the southeast, possibly somewhere in eastern Tennessee. McAndrew goes on to state that the science is inexact, and when you do find out what happened to Beth Doe and who she really was, you will realize that the science truly is, you can't always rely on it. I mean, it, it it sounds very interesting, especially with this particular test that they did. But when you find out where she was actually from, uh, you find out that this science, this particular test did not lead them in a direction that really was going to help them solve this case. As I said, McAndrew and his fellow officers were using the latest of evidence in hoping to solve this case, but of course things didn't happen as quickly as McAndrew had hoped for. Unfortunately for McAndrew, things didn't happen as quickly as he had hoped for. But then there was a huge break. A Queen's father 
was finally arrested for the grisly 1976 strangling and dismemberment of his pregnant teenage girlfriend. Finally, police had their suspect, Luis Sierra, 63, of Ozone Park. According to court papers, Sierra was taken into custody by Pennsylvania state troopers in April 2021, putting an end to the probe into the teen's shocking death. Apparently, the big break came through a DNA match last year using the femur of the long unidentified victim, Evelyn Colon, 15 of Jersey City, to locate her relatives and eventually Sierra, said the court papers. As the murder investigation stretched into the new millennium, Sierra went on with his life as if nothing had happened. He fled Jersey City and eventually landed in Queens. He is now the married father of two, but he is also arrested for the murder of Evelyn Colon. Now in 2014, I mentioned that authorities had sent tooth enamel, bone, and hair samples to the University of South Florida, where the testing had determined the unidentified woman could have been of a native Western or Central Europe. Again, the case went unsolved until a DNA match was found between the victim's bone and Evelyn's nephew on her father's side, and family members soon steered investigators toward the ex-boyfriend. The affidavit reported the victim's sister recalled how Evelyn told her mother back in 1976 that, quote, if anything happened to her, Sierra was likely involved. For the next 44 years, the slain woman was known only as Beth Doe and buried in a grave alongside her unborn child. Now, cold case investigators turned to the DNA again last year and they sent a portion of the slain woman's, woman's femur to a Texas company for further testing. And when the company uploaded the genetic profile into the public genealogy database, they finally got a hit. Luis Colon Jr. told CNN he had used a DNA testing kit to learn more about his heritage and that finding his aunt or her children was always in the back of his mind. He even took multiple tests from a variety of services. What happened next is not anything he could have imagined. It was in early March of this year when he got the phone call. He was hoping for, but wasn't sure would come. He was then asked if he had any relatives who were missing. Colin confirmed that his father's pregnant sister had vanished in 1976, around the same time that Beth Doe was discovered. I get notified that, hey, your DNA was matched to a victim of a homicide, Louise Colin Jr. told CNN. So we got, got in touch and they asked me, do you know anyone missing in your family? And I immediately, once they reached out to me, I knew it was her. Now, when they first talked with Sierra, he initially denied knowing Colin, but eventually claimed that she had moved out of their apartment following an argument. And the Lehigh Valley Live reported that Colin's father, Luis Colin Sr., told cold case detectives that his 15-year-old sister had disappeared after allegedly moving away with her boyfriend, Sierra. He also provided a description of his sister, which matched Beth Doe down to the mole on her cheek and the scar on her leg. Evan and Luis Colin's sister, Migdalia, Colon told state police investigators that Evelyn had moved into an apartment with Sierra in Jersey City in 1976. In mid-December, she had asked the sibling's mother for soup because she wasn't feeling well. When family members brought her soup to the apartment, the apartment was empty and neighbors said the couple had moved. Now, Colon told police that Sierra had been controlling and abusive and that Evelyn once told their mother, that if anything happened to her, as I said before, he was most likely responsible. Now, again, Sierra has been arraigned in a Queens criminal court, and you may be asking why there wasn't a missing persons report made with police, and that's a fair question. But the truth is sad, because the family actually believed Evelyn was safe. 
And this was because Sierra had written in January 1977 and said that Evelyn, who could not write well, had given birth to a healthy baby boy named Luis Sierra Jr. In hindsight, there were some red flags, like when Sierra told them if Evelyn needed anything, she would let her family know. Sierra's arrest has not come without some heartache for the people who knew him as just a guy who lived on their street. Heck, the Daily News reported it, his neighbors were stunned by his arrest. One neighbor said he had known Sierra for 22 years and described him as a nice guy with a family. He's such a sweet guy. He's like a brother to me, this neighbor said. His wife would cook Spanish food and bring it over, and my wife could, would cook Indian food, and we'd have dinner together. Atik Ahmed said he was sorry for Sierra's troubles. Quote, he's a very nice guy. Maybe in the past he was bad, but I don't see him see that in him. According to a probable cause affidavit, Sierra shared a Jersey City apartment with his pregnant girlfriend in the months before her slain. Again, as I mentioned, this is when she had moved out. And according to the victim's sister, you know, that's when... It was just, you know, it was a different time, a different era, different era. So anyway, Sierra was just 19 at the time when he disappeared from the neighborhood. Now, pages from the Sunday Daily News were dated from September 26, 1976, and those were the papers that were found wrapped around the body parts in the suitcases. Pages from the Sunday Daily News dated September 26, 1976 were found in the suitcases with local ads from the paper steering investigators to New Jersey before eventually leading nowhere. Colin Jr. and Colin Veltman, who are brother and sister, told CNN that the family never believed anything nefarious had happened to their aunt. They said the belief was that she had a family of her own and was taking care of them through the years. Now, the long, cold case only took off once authorities finally put a name to the woman's body. State police said in a news release, quote, Numerous interviews and investigational processes were conducted following the identification, which led to the development of a suspect. Quote, We finally, potentially, got the answer, Colin Jr. said. Quote, It gives me peace to know, at least now I know, and we know that she wasn't, she didn't purposely leave us. It's nothing that we did. And that really, really makes me feel good to know. According to the mo morning call, Luis Sierra's defense attorney attacked the lack of forensic evidence linking him to Evelyn Colin's 1976 killing. And Judge Joseph D. Homanco denied a defense request to dismiss the charges. And again, this sets the stage for a legal battle in the 44-year-long mystery. Sierra was charged with one count of homicide in the killing of Colin, who was known only as Beth Doe before Sierra's arrest in April. Sierra's attorney, R. Emmett Madden, argued that there was insufficient evidence to send the case to county court, noting that Sierra did not confess during a six-hour interview with state police last month. Madden questioned Trooper Brian Knoll on why investigators never looked at notorious New Jersey serial killer Richard Cottingham, who was dubbed the Torso Killer, after admitting to killing and dismembering 100 women between 1967 and 1980. I believe that guy needs a story of his own. Luis Sierra is currently locked up in the Carbon County Prison, and there is no date on when Sierra will be back in court. The Colon family will have to wait just a little longer for justice. And anyone who is familiar with this show knows every case that I cover matters, but the number one case I want to see solved is that of Amy Maholovic. I gave a breakdown of her case last week for the people who aren't familiar with her tragic story. The reason I am focusing this month on decades-old cold cases is due to the fact that Amy's case is about to be 32 years old, and there has never been a suspect named. It is a crime that nags at me all the time, but especially this time of year. I had someone on Twitter ask me why I chose her case to begin with, and the answer was simple. It changed my childhood. Teachers and parents began restricting some of our actions, 
and we were certainly restrained or re- retrained on stranger danger and it almost felt as if we lost the trust of adults to make decisions on our own and it's not to say that they didn't have the best intentions but it certainly felt like we were set back as far as the freedom we were slowly earning As a 10-year-old in the late 80s, it was not uncommon to go to the mall with your buddies without adult supervision. Now, I'm not a parent, so I can't say what freedoms the kids have these days, but one thing I know is they have cell phones. It is not unusual to see a kid walking home from school and texting on their phone. I am not sure what age a phone is necessary, that's not my call, but they are at least carrying around little tracking devices. All a parent has to do is turn on the Find My Friends feature and it will tell you exactly where your child, or at least their phone, is. With the invention of the Amber Alert, we all receive notifications on our phones, and this has certainly improved the way authorities communicate with the public. Chief Mark Spetzel told me that if Amy's case happened in this day and age, it would have been solved rather quickly. He explained the digital footprints we leave the myriad of CCTV cameras, and overall general awareness of what doesn't look right. If there is one thing true crime shows do, other than bring attention to older cases, is keep the people who listen or watch on their toes. Regardless of what you say about the genre, it has brought on a tremendous amount of awareness. If it looks wrong, someone may pull out their phone and take a picture or write down a license plate. The capability to take a video with the computer in your pocket, a.k.a. your phone, has enabled the community to do their part in catching a criminal. I am only suggesting that you take out your phone if it doesn't put you in danger, and I would hope you would first call 911 before taking a video. But as we've seen in the cases of Eric Garner, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and the videos taken by Onlooking Bystanders, have been used to hold these people accountable, at least most of these people. So my PSA for the week is to be aware of your surroundings, and if you see something that doesn't look quite right, please take note, and hey, take a video if you can. You never know what those 30 seconds or 8 minutes of video can do. I will always say to people who have filmed some of these incidents, have a tremendous amount of courage because in most cases, there are law enforcement officials telling you to stop. It takes a special kind of person to hold their ground when they see an injustice occurring. There are also a lot of problems with everyone having a camera and social media account because some people choose to shoot the video opposed to calling the police. I'd say to those people, please call the police first, even if it's police brutality you're witnessing. This way you will at least be on record of making the report. Then go ahead and film, but don't make things worse. And so I step off my soapbox for the week. And that's all I have for you. So thank you so much for tuning in. And remember to attend the Walk for Amy on October 27th at Bay Village Middle School. And it marks the 32 years since Amy Mahalovic was abducted. The walk begins at 5 p.m., and you can find more information on walkforamy.org. Now you can also find new episodes of Who Killed? every Friday, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you're interested in the Amy Mahalova case, I suggest you go back to episode 1, October 27, 1989. And I do a 16-part series on the case and talk to all the major players. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast and my other shows, you can help support by using my PayPal username at WilliamHuffman3. Or you can contribute to the show via the Venmo app with my username at Bill-Huffman-3. Every contribution, big or small, helps keep these slow burn podcasts running. Now, you can also help support the show by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Those five stars help keep the important cases I cover, such as the Amy Mahalovic case, in the spotlight. And if you'd like to stay up to date on the cases that I have covered and any new shows that I have coming in the pipeline, because I know that there are a few, 
please follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. Thank you so much again for listening. And until next time, as always, be healthy and stay safe. Have you ever wondered about things that go bump in the night, or objects in the sky, or other things you just couldn't explain? Then join me, Jim Mallard, on my podcast, The Mallard Report. Each week, you'll find engaging conversations with guests who are authors, historians, and scholars who lend their expertise as we discuss current events and venture into the fringe and paranormal. The Mallard Report hits controversies head-on, yet remains conversational, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other major podcast platform. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.